السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household and all his companions may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of them and may he bless every single one of us too Ameen Brothers and sisters Mus'ab ibn Umair radiyallahu anhu Mus'ab ibn Umair radiyallahu anhu a companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who accepted Islam in the early days in Makkah al-Mukarramah when he was still in his teens he was from one of the wealthiest homes in Mecca a young boy they say when you look at him you would be able to see from his face that he is from a very wealthy background and if you had to shake his hand you would know that it was so soft it definitely came from luxury living and at the same time he could be smelt before he was seen which means if you could smell the scent, you would know that Mus'ab is around the corner. Subhanallah. This was a man whose parents loved him dearly. And he was in his teens, he heard about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a person who wore the best of clothing from amongst the youngsters of Quraysh. And he probably drank and ate some of the best food from amongst those of his age group in Quraysh. They looked after him so well, him, and his family members were quite close-knit. Yet when he heard about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he decided to listen to what the message was all about. And he found that this message was something unique. One of the days in the night, he decided to go tiptoeing to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiyallahu anhu. And he knocked on the door. A soft knock was heard on the door. When they opened the door, they found Mus'ab ibn Umair, this teenager, one of the wealthiest in Mecca, the children of one of the wealthiest in Mecca. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were so delighted. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was happy. They welcomed him in. He sat down. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not cut his speech. He continued talking. On that eve, he was talking about the fire and Jahannam and life after death and how people will either go into heaven or hell depending on the deeds that they have done in their lifetime. And Mus'ab ibn Umair heard all this and he heard several verses of the Quran being recited. It touched his heart and he knew that what my people are doing is absolutely wrong. They fight with each other. They are killing each other. They are worshipping stones and sticks and they have a lot of superstitious beliefs so Mus'ab ibn Umair declared his faith to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam but because he came from a background that was quite different he chose to keep it a secret it was between him and the Muslimin that he had accepted Islam every night just like the others, he used to tiptoe out of his home and he used to go to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam radiallahu anhu where they used to meet with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and learn the Quran and learn revelation and learn about the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happened? He learned so much. He became known as a person who knew more of the Quran than others in his age group. What a powerful youngster. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and our youth from those who are keen on learning and from those who fight laziness. Today, one of the biggest hobbies that a lot of the youth have is to sleep. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. May Allah grant us ease and goodness. Every moment we waste, Wallahi, we have thrown it aside. May Allah make us from amongst those who realize and understand that while sleep is important, too much of it is actually not only detrimental to our health, but even to our spirituality and our link with Allah and our preparation for the day that we meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was a man known as Uthman ibn Talha. We spoke about him the other day. Uh, Uthman ibn Talha, he saw Al-Arqam, he saw Mus'ab ibn Umair go to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam by night. And he saw him do that more than once. And then he saw him pray the Salah that was that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that time, Salah was not compulsory. The prayer was not compulsory, but they used to pray on a voluntary basis. So he saw Mus'ab ibn Umair 
fulfill the prayer in the way that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prays. So what did he do? Uthman ibn Talha went to the mother of Musab ibn Umair and told her that you know what? Your son has followed that man who has reneged from our faith and our religion, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So Uthman ibn Talha, when he told the mother that and Quraysh found that out, his parents called him. Musab ibn Umair's parents called him because he was the most beloved child. And they started convincing him, you know what you're doing is wrong. We come from a very wealthy background. We are very influential people. What don't you have in your life? You are leading a life of luxury. And the son kept on saying, you know what? What Muhammad has said is right. I need to prepare for paradise. What we have in this world is not enough for us to go to heaven. If we do not believe in the oneness of our maker and worship him and him alone. So the youngster, they continue to try to persuade him. We will punish you. We will penalize you. We will take away whatever we've given you. He did not listen to them. So what they did is they tied him in the home. They literally tied him and kept him in the house. They did not let him come out. He still did not turn. They stopped his food and drink, his clothing and so many other things. They began to punish him, penalize him so much so that the people of Quraysh engaged or participated in harming this youngster that came from a very wealthy background. He lost everything he had, subhanallah. Yet the day, a few days before that, when he accepted Islam, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum say, before he entered, we could already smell that Musab ibn Umair is coming, subhanallah. And a few days later, he lost everything. The perfumes are gone, the clothing is gone, the food is gone, and he starts losing weight. And after some time, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed some of his companions to go to Africa, Africa, Habasha. So Musab ibn Umair was one of those who went in the first batch according to some narrations. And after a few days or after some time, there was rumor that the Muslims were victorious and so on. So some of them came back. Musab ibn Umair was one of those who came back, spent a little bit more time in Mecca and went back to Africa. So some of the narrations say he went twice. Some of them say he went once. But what is confirmed is he definitely did go to Africa and he spent time there, but he missed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he decided, I'm going back to Mecca. So now he went back to Mecca to Al-Mukarramah and he spent more time with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But this time he was not with his own family. He was a person who was like a homeless person where as wealthy as he was and as rich as his family was prior to him accepting Islam and the fact that he lost everything, he did not go back to what his forefathers were doing. So Musab ibn Umair radiallahu an. When it came to the pledge of allegiance in Aqaba, when the first group of people came from Medina and met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mina, just prior to the Hijra, approximately one year and a few months prior to the Hijra, the first group of people that came, they had pledged allegiance with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Medina Munawwara in Mina. And what happened is, when they left, they sent a message to say, we want you to send someone who knows the deen and the religion and who knows revelation, who knows some rules and regulations to come to Medina and to teach us the faith and to keep us on the path. So the Prophet ﷺ chose the one who knew the most at the time, the one who was most befitting for that particular task. The first ambassador of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever, Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu was sent to al Madinah al munawwara And he was the first who went. His mission was to teach them goodness and to be a person who taught them revelation and what was right and wrong in terms of the deen. When he arrived there, As'ad ibn Zurara radiallahu anhu, who had accepted Islam in that pledge of allegiance in Aqaba, the first time he was the one who kept Mus'ab ibn Umayr and hosted him. And mashallah, he did so much good work in Medina Munawwara in one year that so many people accepted Islam. The following year, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam met with more than 70 of the people from Medina Munawwara who had accepted Islam. And that was the second allegiance that happened in Aqaba and after that was the Hijrah. So Musab ibn Umair, I want to mention to you one story, one of what happened when he was in Medina Munawwara. It is reported that Usaid ibn Hudayr, who was one of the leaders of Bani Abdul Ashhal from the people of Medina Munawwara, he heard of Musab having come and spent his days with As'ad ibn Zurara radiallahu an, and this man was very upset because people were now talking in Medina about the true religion, the religion of monotheism.
and the messenger that had come to Mecca. So Usaid ibn Hudayr decided, let's go and beat up this man and sort him out. Similar to what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu decided some time back with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Usaid ibn Hudayr got his spear and he marched towards where Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu was. And As'ad ibn Zurara saw this man coming and he told Mus'ab, this is one of the leaders of Bani Abdul Ashhal. And the truth is, he's a very harsh man. He's a very harsh man. Be careful. Mus'ab ibn Umair was calm. As Usaid ibn Hudayr walks in, he started swearing and shouting and screaming, you are the one who has split our community into two. You are the one who did this and that. Mus'ab ibn Umair says, would you not like to sit down and listen to a few words of what I've said? If I'm wrong, perhaps you may decide to do something to me. But if I'm right and correct, perhaps you will listen to what I have to say. So Usaid ibn Hudayr saw that this young man was very intelligent. He said, okay, let's listen to what you have. So he mentioned verses of the Quran. He spoke about goodness. He spoke about worshiping Allah alone. He spoke about Jannah and Jahannam accountability. And Usaid ibn Hudayr says, you know what? What you have said makes the most sense from any speech I've ever heard in my life. How do I enter the fold of this religion? So Musab ibn Umair says, well, you need to bathe correctly and come and declare the Shahada. So he bathed and he came and declared the Shahada. In the meantime, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, who was one of the other leaders of Bani Abdul Ashhal, he decides that he wants to do the job that Usaid ibn Hudayr did not do. When he saw Usaid ibn Hudayr come back with a different face, he looked at him and said, Usaid, you went out to do something to Mus'ab ibn Umair, but I see you've come back a very calm person. He says, I tell you what that man has said has touched me, subhanallah. So when Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, at that time he was not a Muslim yet, he went to do exactly the same thing that Usaid ibn Hudayr had gone to do, and exactly the same thing happened to him too, where he heard the speech and the statement because Mus'ab ibn Umair was such a calm youngster very handsome very very calm and what happened is he calmed him down and this man it touched his heart and he accepted the faith he says I bear witness that definitely Allah is one and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in this way this man Sa'd ibn Mu'adh went back to Bani al-Ashhal his people and they told him oh Sa'd you went to do this to Mus'ab ibn Umair you came back and you are following his faith so he himself said, don't you consider me one of your leaders? They said, yes. Well, I am telling you what the man has said is right. So the bulk of them, if not all of that particular group, Bani al-Ashhal accepted Islam more or less the same day. Subhanallah. This was the effort of Musa ibn Umair radiallahu anhu. He was a man whom when he came back from Abyssinia, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw him. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum were crying because they saw him now. His skin had changed. He became rough and tough. He did not have proper clothing. He was dressed in cloth that did not even cover him properly. Yet just a few years earlier, he, when he entered Islam, he had clothing that was dragging on the floor. Subhanallah, it did not deter him so much so that later he returned with those who went to pledge the second allegiance to Mecca to Mukarramah and he did not come back except when the Hijrah took place. He was the first together with Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu an. The two of them were the first to do the Hijrah to Medina Munawwara. So he was in Medina before the Hijrah. He went back to Mecca and he was one of the first or the first with Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu an to engage in that particular Hijrah. My brothers and sisters, the battle of Badr took place. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave Musab ibn Umair the white flag of the Muslims and mashallah he did very well. The battle of Uhud took place with the Kuffar of Quraysh who had beaten up the same people. And in fact, just before that, after the battle of Badr, the brother of Musa ibn Umair was amongst the captives. So Musa ibn Umair passed his brother and his name was Abu Aziz. And he looks at him and he says to the, the captives, those who had taken him captive, that this man asked for a lot of wealth. He has a very rich mother, subhanallah, and that's his own brother. So the brother looks at him and says, what are you saying? He says, I know what I'm saying. You have a very wealthy mother and she will pay for you. Subhanallah. Anyway, the battle of Uhud, what happened at the battle of Uhud was Musa ibn Umair was given the flag of the Muslimin. And as he was participating in the battle, a certain man from amongst the enemy came and sliced his right hand. So the flag fell. And at that time, when the flag falls, it means the, that group has lost. So when the flag fell, he immediately caught it with the other hand. And that enemy sliced the other hand. 
So he immediately caught it underneath his chin according to some narrations or he held it with part of his mouth and with his shoulder and made sure it was up until they hit him again and the flag dropped until another companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam got hold of that flag. Subhanallah. And this was the day that Musab ibn Umair was martyred on the day of Uhud. So much so that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam after that was looking at the martyrs from amongst them was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. From amongst them was Musab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with all of them. When they tried to bury him, they found that they did not have enough material and cloth to bury him. If they covered his face, his feet were showing. If they covered his feet, his face was showing. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, Wallahi, there was a time when I did not know a person who had a more luxurious life than this man. And today, out of his love of Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this deen of his, he has sacrificed in a way that he has nothing to even cover cover his body after he has been martyred. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam chose to cover his face and asked for a green branch to cover where his feet were. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him paradise. When we go to Uhud, we should remember the name Musab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu as well. And we should say our salam to him. May Allah's peace be upon him and upon Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and the others who lost their lives on that particular day of Uhud. This was Musab ibn Umair in a nutshell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. Our next hero is someone who had a similar background but in a totally different area. He comes from Isfahan where Iran is today, the Persian Empire. A young boy from another very wealthy home. His father was the chief of a village known as Jayyan in Isfahan. And this man, he was the chief of the village, he looked after his children. His son was also the favorite to him. Subhanallah. He did not leave his son. The son's name was Salman. Salman from Persia. Salman al-Farisi. Subhanallah. This Salman radiallahu an, young boy, his father loved him again, a wealthy person. You could see that he was from a very wealthy background, but he was very deeply involved in what his family was involved in. They were the leaders of the fire worshippers and those who worshipped the sun. Then they were known as Al Majus. So he used to be in charge as a young boy of keeping the flame alive. So he would bring for it fuel all the time and people worship the flame. And he used to tell himself, you know, I keep the flame alive. I bring the logs, I bring everything. And then people are worshiping the same fire. And it's me who's in charge. A young boy, he was very young. So his father used to keep him in the home and within the vicinity, never allowed him to go anywhere. And he never ever interacted and mixed with people. One day, his father being a big businessman, his father was very busy and something important needed to take needed to happen. He had a job that he could not do. So he told his son, Oh, my son, I want you to go to the marketplace to do this and come back immediately. The son says, No problem, excited youngster. So what did he do? He took whatever his father told him and he was going to the marketplace and suddenly he noticed people singing in a church. For the first time in his life, he saw Christians people of the book. So he stopped and he watched them. These people are not worshipping the fire. Wow. What is it all about? He looked for a little while and he decided, let me go into the church. So he walked into the church and he stood for a while. He listened to what they had to say. Someone spoke to him. He asked a few questions and he told himself, you know what? This is much better than what we are doing. Subhanallah. Look at the intelligence of the youngster. We are worshipping the fire. My people are worshipping a fire that I keep alive. And this, these people are actually praying. They are calling out to a power. Subhanallah. People of the book. May Allah grant them goodness. It is reported that they were upon the true Christianity. Wallahu a'lam. But they were truthful in a way that when he asked them, where is the origin of this faith? They led him to Jerusalem. They told him it is in a sham. If you go to the region where Palestine is today, subhanallah, they told him you will find the roots of this particular faith. So he decided I'm going to go there. Youngster, very brave. When he went back home, he had forgotten to go to the marketplace. It was too late and he couldn't go. So his father told him, did you do what I told you? He says, no, dad, I actually saw a group of people worshiping and they were worshiping a God, not the fire. They are known as Christians. And you know what? What they are worshiping is better than what we are doing. His father was very angry, upset. Salman al-Farisi, subhanallah. His father was angry and upset and told him, you know what? These people are bad and they are wrong. There is no goodness in their faith. 
But because his father was very worried that this man was, this youngster was going to renege, turn away from the faith of his forefathers. They tied him with a leg iron, literally with a chain. They tied him in the house. He could not go out. He was jailed in his own house. Look at how the similarities are with Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu. This was Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. So he sent a message to the church to say, I am the young boy. I am part of your followers. I am stuck at home tied up. If a caravan is going to Asham, where the religion comes from, please let me know. I will make a plan. I want to join the caravan and I want to run away from home. So he wanted Christianity so desperately because he knew that it is a far better faith than that of worshiping the fire. So now when after some time the caravan was going and they sent him a message. So he made a plan and somehow he managed to get out of that leg iron that he had some trick he used. We don't know exactly what some of the narrations make mention of how exactly it happened, but he got out of it and he ran away. He went into the caravan and he arrived in a sham, such an excited youngster. His dream was fulfilled. He went to the root where the faith was and there he met with the top bishops, the archbishops and he went to the leader of the lot and he told them his story and he said I'd like to stay with you and I'd like to be from amongst those who serves you and who learns the man says no problem so Salman al Farisi spent some time there but he noticed that this leader had a lot of bad habits he was stealing the money of charity people were being charitable donating to the poor and the leader of the church was taking the money and eating it himself and he was keeping it in a treasure and one day the man died when the man died all those who were his followers and the top followers, the senior clerics, they had come and they were praising him and so on. And Salman came out and he says, you know, I stayed with this man. He was a crook. They were very angry. What do you mean he was a crook? He said, look, he used to stash away all the wealth that people gave for charity. They said, that's not true. He said, wait, before you make up your mind, let me show you where it is. I know where he used to hide it. So he took them and he showed them and there was a whole lot of treasure that was definitely there. So they were very angry and upset. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Anyway, another man took over. And Salman al Farisi says he was such an honest, upright leader of the Christians. He was such a good man. At that time, I loved him the most from all people ever at that time. And what happened is when he was about to die, I went to him and I told him, do you know what? You know my story. I want to follow the unchanged scripture. I don't want to follow the changes that we are noticing. And I know that you are an honest person. Tell me, who do I go to from here? So this man says, you know what? You can go to Al Mawsil in Iraq. There is a person with this name. He is honest and he preaches the unchanged Bible. So Salman al Farisi, after some time, he succeeded to travel to Al Mawsil. And there he met with the other man and indeed he was an honest upright man teaching the, the Christian faith. And Salman was a solid Christian, subhanallah. Yet his father was still worshipping fire. He did not even have any news about his father. And after that, this man also, when he was at his deathbed, Salman al Farisi went to him and told him, do you know my story? I want to follow the unchanged Bible. And I want you to tell me where do I go to meet a truthful person? Because I've seen others who have been untruthful. So that man told him, go to an Nasibin, another place, a certain area towards a Sham from Iraq, between Iraq and Sham. And you will find X and you follow him a certain person and he will be a person who will lead you to what is right. That exactly happened subhanallah. And after that, the same thing happened there. We're at the deathbed. Salman al Farisi asks him again, where should I go? And he led him to Ammuriya. He said, go to Ammuriya, you will find a leader and that leader will follow you. So when Salman traveled again as a youngster to Ammuriya, he went and he met one of the leaders of the Christians, a very good man who taught him a lot of goodness. Finally, when that man arrived at his death, subhanallah, look at how many people were dying one after the other. But when that man arrived at his death, Salman al Farisi asked him, look, I need the goodness. I want unchanged scripture. I want to worship Allah. I want to worship God. Please lead me to what is right. I don't want to be lost. So that man who was one of the bishops of Ammuriya, he told him, look, now there are no more honest people. But we have arrived at a time when a messenger has to come from Allah Almighty. 
a messenger has to come and it is reported he will come in Arabia. You see a lot of the Jewish people shifted to near where Medina was to Arabia because they knew from their scriptures that this is the description of the land where the final messenger is going to come. That's why they were found there. But when he came and he was not from amongst them, he was from amongst the Arabs. They decided we don't want to accept this man. Why is he not from amongst us? May Allah protect us from racism and may he protect us from rejecting the truth when it comes from people of a different nationality or people from a different race altogether. May Allah grant us a lesson, my brothers and sisters. So here Salman al-Farisi, when he heard that it is a rocky land, and between the two rocky deserts, there is a greenery of palm. He decided, inshallah, one day I will go there. Anyway, the man who told him this passed away. And after some time, there was a caravan of business people who came from the Arabian Peninsula. And Salman began to ask them questions and found that they were indeed from a land that he wanted to go to. Look at how Allah takes him from where to where. So Salman decides, you know, I've got a few of these animals with me. Can I give them to you? They were people from the Kalb tribe. I give them to you and you take me to Arabia. They said, no problem. They took his animals. They took him. When they got to a place known as Wadil Qura, they told him, right, we are enslaving you. You are now a captive of ours and you now will be sold in the market. He was shocked. He was shocked, but he knew that Allah will not do something bad to him. So they sold him to someone who was a Jewish man and the Jewish man took him in Wadi Al-Qura and Salman began to work and he worked very hard Subhanallah and he worked so hard and after some time the cousins of this man one of them came to Wadi Al-Qura and bought Salman off his own cousin and who was this cousin? The cousin was from Banu Quraida. They had settled around Medina. So Salman, he decided, okay, I'm going with this new master of mine. Let me go. He was a free man, a free boy who was enslaved unjustly. And here he was being sold from one to the other. But Allah wanted him to get to Medina by at any cost, subhanallah. So when he got to Banu Quraida, he noticed the desert. He noticed the rocks. He saw the greenery, the orchards, and he was so excited. He says, Subhanallah, I'm sure this is the place where this messenger is going to come. And he was so happy and delighted. So he worked very hard for this master of his. And one day, another cousin came in from Al Madin Al Munawwara. One of the Jewish people had come to see his master. And he was busy on one of the trees taking out some dates. And what happened is he heard this man say that. Oh, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, they will be destroyed. Look at them. They want to follow a man who's just come from Mecca. He's claiming to be a prophet and he's claiming to say this and that. Salman says, I got such a, a surprise, such a pleasant surprise. I shook in a way that I almost dropped off the tree. And I quickly rushed down the tree and got to my master with his cousin. And I said, what did you say? Can you repeat it? And my master gave me one smack and sent me back to work. He says, who are you? What do you have to do with this? Go back. He says, but I heard they said that he is living in Quba. So that night, very quietly, I took some dates. Why did I take dates? He says that man in Amuria, one of those Christian leaders told me that when the messenger comes, there will be clear signs that prove he's a messenger. He will not eat charity, but he will eat from a gift and he will have a mark on his back, that which will be a seal of prophethood. When you see that, you know he is the Prophet. So Salman al-Farisi, he decides to take some dates and he went to Quba. He says, I saw this messenger. I looked at him. I was so excited. And I, I said, you know, you people are not from this place. I've brought some charity that I want to give you. These are some dates and I want you to eat them. So Muhammad sallallahu thanked him and accepted the charity and so on. And the Sahaba, some of them began to eat. But Muhammad sallallahu did not eat. Why? because it was a charity. So Salman says, okay, that's one, one sign done. So after a few days, he heard that Muhammad sallallahu shifted to Medina already. He went to Medina with some more dates and he looked at Muhammad sallallahu He says, oh, he, 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 told, he told him, you know what? I've brought you a gift because I believe you don't eat charity. So Muhammad sallallahu took it, gave some of his companions and ate from it. So he said, okay, that's the second sign done. This man eats a gift, but he won't eat a charity. Then after some after a few days, there was someone who died and was being buried and Muhammad was at Baqiyah assisting in the burial. So Salman had 
arrived in Baqiyah and he noticed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam between his clothing. He was looking very hard to see that mark on his back where his shoulders are and he's trying to look where is the seal. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at him and noticed that he's trying to look at the seal of prophethood. So he actually pushed his clothing off in a, in a way that the seal became clear. When Salman saw it, he began to weep and he kissed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he declared his shahada. He says, I've seen all three signs and told him his story. Subhanallah. But now the problem was he was a slave. So what happened? He could not take part in the battle of Badr. He could not take part in the battle of Uhud. Then Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you know what? Oh Salman, ask your master if we can buy you or if you can pay for your own freedom. So he spoke to his master. His master told him something impossible. He says, I want you to plant 300 date palms that all bear fruit. Now at that time, when you plant 20, 30, only two or three or five or 10 might bear fruit. The rest of them may die because of weather conditions. And 300 is a whole orchard. That was something that the wealthiest of the lot used to have. So for one man to do it, it's going to take a long time. And on top of that, I want 40 ounces of gold. So Salman al-Farisi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa asked him what happened. He told him, look, he wants 300 plantations which will not die and they will bear fruit. So anyway, the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave him these pods. Until he had 300 of them, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told him, you go and start digging little holes, you know, in the ground and I will come and plant each one. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came and he planted every single one of the 300. And guess what? Exactly 300, all of them grew and bore fruit in no time. Subhanallah. Now the 40 ounces of gold, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told him, here is this little piece of gold which looked like an egg. Take it and give it to your master. Tell him, right, I'm free now. So Salman al-Farisi was wondering if that was 40 ounces. When they weighed it, it was exactly 40 ounces on the dot. He gave it to him and he was set free. Subhanallah. Salman al-Farisi, I'm going to spend a few moments telling you a little bit more about this man. He was from Persia, but he was loved by the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The battle of the trench. He is the hero of the battle of the trench because when the Kuffar of Mecca, they were thousands who were now coming to Medina in order to attack the Muslims. There was no way that they were not going to be entering Medina Munawwara. But Salman al-Farisi was one of those who said, Oh messenger in Persia, when the enemy comes and we want to block him from coming, we used to dig a big trench approximately 10 meters by 16 meters. And we used to make sure that they cannot even cross the trench so they don't enter the city at all. So let us do it. And subhanallah, that was adopted by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hence, it is called the battle of the trench. Why? Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, it was his idea. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed it for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the young man from Persia. So during that battle, subhanallah, they, they dug in no time in the parts around Medina Munawwara where it was accessible to enter from. Those parts that were quite rocky that it was not accessible from, they did not dig. So it was not a trench dug around the whole city, but it was dug around the parts of the city wherein people would be able to enter from. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an, he has a story with Abu Darda radiallahu an. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu was another companion whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had asked Salman al-Farisi to live with when they came into Medina Munawwara after some time. So. Abu Darda'i radiallahu anhu, he became the fostered brother of Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu notices the wife of Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. She took no interest in dressing, no interest in any appearance, no interest in food or anything else. So she, he asked her, what is the problem? So she answered him saying, you know, your brother Abu Darda, he finds no need in this world, nothing, nothing at all, which means he's not interested in his wife. So Salman al-Farisi waited for Abu Darda at night. And when the night started, he began to read long salah. Salman stopped him and told him, do you know what? Go and sleep. So he went to sleep. A little while later, he got up again. He says, go to sleep. A little while later, he got up again. He says, go to sleep. And when the third of the night was remaining, Salman got him up and said, now if you want to pray, you may pray. Then he said, oh Abu Darda, remember, 
Your body has a right over you. Your wife has a right over you. Your family has a right over you. Everything has a right over you. You must fulfill the rights of absolutely everything. And you don't have to overdo it when it comes to acts of worship of this nature. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu listened to him because he was knowledgeable, but he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Hey, this is what happened between me and Salman. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Sadaqa Salman. Salman has spoken the truth. What he told you is right. You must fulfill the rights of your family members and understand that too is an act of worship. May Allah make us from amongst those. Salman al-Farisi at some stage became the Amir of Madain. Madain is an area in Iraq. And he was the Amir, but he did not change at all. The stipend he used to get on a monthly basis made up of approximately 500, 5,000 coins. He used to give it all away. When they came to build a house for him, they knew that this man does not want a big house. So he asked the builder, what type of a house will you build for me? The builder says something that will shade you from the sun, protect you from the cold. When you stand up, it will hit your head. And when you lie down, it will hit your feet. That's how small it will be. He says, yes, now you know me. That's the house. And that is what they built for him. And he was the Amir of Madain. On one instance, he went out and there was a man who had come from a sham. And what happened is that man was carrying belongings and, and a lot of goods. So Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu was the Amir, but they did not know this. He offered to help the man and he started carrying the goods. And this man says, oh, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair and what have you. And as they're walking people, they met a group of men who greeted him as the Amir, the governor of Madain. And they told him, assalamu alaykum, oh Amir. So this man from Asham looks, he says, who's the Amir? They looked, they said, the man who's carrying your goods, subhanallah. This was Salman al-Farisi, a simple man. It is reported that, subhanallah, one day he was cooking and baking. So the visitors came to his house and they said, where is your girl, the girl who works for you? He said, no, we sent her to do another task. And I am a person who does not give two tasks to the same person. They will do one thing at a time. May Allah grant us goodness. Imagine he did it himself. How many of us, you have someone working for you. You tell them clean here. While they are cleaning, you say, don't forget to wash the plates. Before they wash the plates, you said, you got to cook this today. While they are cooking or before they cook, you tell them you got to do this 20 things. And at the end of the day, you tell them you forgot to do this and that. But even you are not a computer, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to treat those who work for us with utmost respect. The last thing I would like to tell you about Salman al-Farisi. On his deathbed, he was crying. And when he was crying, subhanallah, he asked for something. And his wife brought it to him. In it, there was musk. Musk is a scent. He said, when I die, I want you to spray this musk on me. Because the angels who come to take us, they love a good fragrance. Subhanallah. So we learn something. And this is why to this day, when people die, what do we do? We enshroud them. And any form of good itr or perfume oil that is used, inshallah, we use it in order to make sure that there is a good scent coming from the person. May Allah grant us a good death. He passed away in Al Madain and he was buried very near to Baghdad up to this day. His grave is there. He passed away approximately at the age of uh, late 70s, some say 78 years old at the time uh, of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And it is reported that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu attended the janazah. Wallahu alam, Allah knows best. But this was our hero, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. May Allah grant us a good lesson. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.